Welcome back to Unprecedential. This is Adam White. On February 21st, 2020, we were joined at AEI by Keith E. Whittington, the Princeton professor, the scholar of the Supreme Court, whose latest book is a fascinating study of the history of judicial review in America. The book is titled Repugnant Laws, Judicial Review of Acts of Congress from the Founding to the Present. It's a fascinating book. Go out and read it. But in the meantime, you can listen to our discussion. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Adam White. I'm a resident scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to introduce this discussion and to introduce today's featured guest. In his famous study of American democracy, Alexis de Tocqueville observed that there is almost no political question in the United States that's not resolved sooner or later into a judicial question. That line is so familiar now that it's almost cliche, but perhaps Tocqueville's insight was even more true than we thought we knew. In a new book, a leading scholar of American constitutionalism examines 1,308 cases decided by the Supreme Court from 1789 to 2018, in which the court judged the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. This study and the conclusions that it draws are a landmark achievement in American constitutional law. The book is Repugnant Laws, Judicial Review of Acts of Congress from the Founding to the Present, and its author is our guest today. Professor Keith Whittington, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Professor Whittington, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. I appreciate y'all having me, and I appreciate y'all coming out early this morning for this. This is a project that took a long time to get off the ground. I initially expected it would be a relatively um, short piece of work motivated in part by the Rehnquist Court in the late 90s, striking down lots of acts of Congress. And then eventually it sort of grew into being a much more complicated, difficult book to put together, in part because I realized as I dug into it, that I didn't know enough about how the court had actually exercised the power of reviewing congressional statutes over time. And I really needed to spend more time really digging into the court's records in order to get more of a sense of what this actually looked like in practice. One interesting feature of the modern court is that everybody from the political left to the political right is a judicial activist now. Everybody wants the court to be exercising judicial review. There are deep disagreements about when the court ought to be exercising judicial review, which laws ought to be struck down. But we're at a point where people both on the left and the right want laws to be struck down. They want the court to be out there aggressively enforcing the Constitution, not only against Congress, but also against other government officials. That was not always true. Through much of American history, the political left in particular was quite critical of the court as a potential enforcer of constitutional rules against government officials. The populist and then the progressives at the late 19th century and early 20th century, denounced the court as illegitimate and anti-democratic. And this argument was popular on the left to think the court should not be exercising judicial review more generally. Conservatives, meantime, were very encouraging of the court and thought the court was a critical bulwark of protecting individual liberties against democratic forces in general. Eventually, the political left came around and became supportive of the court as well found their own interest in supporting the institution of judicial review and what it could do for the kinds of things that they were concerned about. We may be at an interesting moment as to whether or not the political left remains interested in the court and judicial review going forward, or whether or not they also make the same calculation that progressives were making in the early 20th century, that there's nothing in it for them in judicial review, and they'd rather attack the court and delegitimize the court rather than hold it up. But at least for several decades, we had a period in which both political left and political right wanted the court to be active, but disagreed about what that looked like. That reflected the fact that the court had become a very important part of the American constitutional system in general and how we actually enforce constitutional rules in practice. And again, this was not always true, that we now think of the court as being a critically important part of the system of checks and balances and how we maintain constitutionalism over time. That was certainly not how James Madison thought about the constitutional system. For him, the court was mostly an afterthought. The possibility of judicial review seemed relatively small, though I think it was something that was anticipated by the founders and the founding generation more generally. 
But for them, the court was a relatively modest player in the constitutional system as a whole and American politics more generally. But that changes. Over the course of the 19th century, the court becomes much more important and prominent. Even the term judicial review that for us is very familiar in the way we talk about the power of the court to strike down laws that are unconstitutional isn't coined until the turn of the 20th century. One of my predecessors at Princeton University, uh, the constitutional historian Edward Corwin, was the first one to characterize this power to strike down laws as unconstitutional as being judicial view. That was a term that stuck, but there were lots of other terms people were floating at the time to describe this power that the court was exercising. And people were starting to try to talk about it and try to find a shorthand way of talking about this power in the early 20th century, precisely because of how prominent the court had become and how important it had become within the system. And so there was a desire to try to make more sense of it and try to talk about it more than was tends to be true in the early decades of the American experience. The book is really motivated by trying to figure out, in part, How much does the court actually constrain Congress in practice? How active has the court been in resisting congressional encroachments on the Constitution across American history? I don't focus on states, and that's an important aspect of what the U.S. Supreme Court has done through its history is monitor the states and keep them within constitutional bounds. Likewise, it doesn't focus on the presidency as such and how much the court is monitoring executive branch officials for potential violations they might be engaging in. Instead, it's concerned with legislative power, federal legislative power, and how much the court is willing to push back against Congress as it exercises that power. And likewise, trying to take up this question of initially raised by the populace, but ultimately becomes quite an important one, of just how anti-democratic is the court? That is, to the extent to which how much does the court push back against democratic forces, against popular majorities in practice uh, across American history? Is it really the case that the court behaves in the kind of way that populist progressives feared the court behaved in? My conclusions, ultimately looking across this history, do echo conclusions that one, Brutus made in the early debates over the ratification of the Constitution, and secondly, Robert Dahl made, an eminent political scientist in the mid-20th century. Brutus had said in warning the other anti-federalist about whether or not to ratify the Constitution that he expected the federal judicial power generally, the U.S. Supreme Court specifically, would tend to lean strongly in favor of the general government and would tend to expand the scope of the general government over time, and in doing so, expand the scope and power of the federal courts themselves over time. Brutus thought that would be a good reason to resist the adoption of the U.S. Constitution because this would be launching a system that would expand over time. And I think Brutus has basically been right. The Supreme Court mostly has not been an institution that has held back Congress from growing over time, but instead has been an institution that is constantly advocating for Congress and helping encourage Congress to expand its authority over time. The court has mostly been a cheerleader for the expansion of congressional power over time rather than a significant check on how Congress has exercised authority across American history. And likewise, Dahl, writing in the mid-20th century, was concerned with this kind of question that the populists and progressives had raised about the idea of the court being an anti-democratic institution acting on behalf of minorities. And Dahl, as an empirical political scientist, was quite skeptical about the possibility of the court playing that kind of role. Dahl said, If the court did, in fact, uphold minorities against national majorities, as both its supporters and critics often seem to believe, it would be an extremely anomalous institution from a democratic point of view. He thought it was very hard to imagine how you would construct a political institution like the court within a democratic system that would nonetheless consistently come to the defense of minorities against national political majorities more generally. He did some empirical work that suggested to him that the court, in fact, tended not to behave that way. It tended to reflect the interest of national political majorities majorities, not necessarily the interest of political minorities more generally. And the book, in part, is concerned with trying to reinvestigate that question and bring more data to bear and trying to examine how the courts actually behaved across its history. As I noted then, ultimately, the book winds up looking at over 1,300 cases in which the court substantively evaluated the constitutionality of the application of a federal law in a case before them. This is dramatically more cases than I think we commonly think the court has actually exercised power of judicial review against Congress. We have a canonical list of cases the Congressional Research Service maintains about how often the court has struck down federal laws over time. That list actually was initially developed by the same Edward Corwin who coined the term judicial review. He initially created that list in the early part of the 20th century. I think it actually misses quite a few cases. It leaves out quite a lot of how much the court has pushed back against Congress over time. But that list doesn't even try to identify cases in which the court has upheld 
exercises of congressional power over time. And that's actually a lot of what the court has done with the power of judicial review over time. So I think across these 1,300 cases or so, only about a quarter of them result in the court invalidating acts of Congress and refusing to apply acts of Congress in cases in front of them because of constitutional problems, which means three quarters of the cases the court is saying that the Congress is perfectly fine to exercise the power they're trying to exercise in that case. And they turn away litigants who are trying to argue that Congress has exceeded its constitutional limits. Generally, I think we underestimate both how early the court was exercising judicial review and also how often the court has exercised judicial review, specifically relative to Congress across American history. In part, I think because we look for the wrong things in trying to think about judicial review, we're looking for certain telltale signs of judicial review that misunderstands the variety of ways in which the court effectively exercises the power of limiting Congress under the Constitution in cases that come before it. In addition, we tend to focus our attention on high-profile, politically salient cases. And the vast majority of the cases in which the court has reviewed Congress, both the ones where it's upholding laws, but also the ones where it's striking laws down, have not involved politically salient cases. They've not involved particularly important statutory provisions or particularly important statutes. They don't make the front page of the New York Times. The relatively modest cases involving relatively small and insignificant features of statutory schemes. And as a consequence, we tend to overlook them. And across time, we tend to forget about those cases entirely. But that's actually how the court mostly exercised judicial review. And it's mostly how they built up the power of judicial review is by exercising power in those kinds of cases. I think Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story was suggestive of a certain style in which the court exercised judicial review that's been prominent across its history. It was particularly prominent in the 19th century and has led us in part, I think, to underestimate how often the court exercised judicial review. In a circuit court case, when Supreme Court justices at the time rode circuit so they would sit in trial cases out in the countryside as well as uh, sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court in an appellate capacity. In one of those cases, Justice Story wrote an opinion in a case in which there was a constitutional challenge to a federal law. And Story notes the attitude that the court should take when thinking about these kinds of constitutional challenges that are brought up about federal statutes in particular he notes, whenever it becomes a duty to decide on the constitutionality of laws, sound discretion requires that the court should not lightly presume the excess of power by the legislative body, nor so construe the generality of words as to extend them beyond its lawful authority unless the conclusion be unavoidable. As little reason could there be to imagine the legislature would voluntarily transcend its constitutional authority, the language must be very clear and precise, which would impose on the court the duty of declaring the solemn act of the legislature to be void. The court could never incline so to construe doubtful expressions, much less to seek astutely for hidden interpretations, which might darkly lead to such results. So if courts go into the process of evaluating constitutionality of laws on the assumption that Congress is not trying to violate the Constitution, generally it shouldn't be said that they are violating the Constitution, the court should instead enforce constitutional boundaries in part by reinterpreting statutes in order to avoid those constitutional conflicts. Now, notably, this is not an avoidance canon. Story is not suggesting that the court should avoid having to resolve constitutional questions. What Story is advocating is the court ought to identify where the constitutional limits are to congressional power and emphasize that what the litigants are asking the court to do is to apply the law in a way that would extend beyond those powers and then refuse to do so. And so insist that, in fact, the law has to be interpreted in a way that brings it within the boundaries of the Constitution as so identified. It's an effort to enforce the Constitution, but enforcing the Constitution not by saying Congress has explicitly violated the Constitution and the law is void, but instead to qualify, to restrict, to narrow what statutes can do, to carve out exceptions in statutes that are not there um, in the text and that the government was not previously recognizing in order to say, we can make this statute fit within the confines of the Constitution that, in fact, is going to be enforced by the court as a whole. This is a common strategy the court has adopted over time. It was very common in the 19th century for the court to adopt this strategy. And the consequence of adopting this strategy was not then that the court was not enforcing constitutional limits against Congress, but enforced them in a particular kind of way. One result, I think, of sort of going back to the sources and actually trying to review all these cases, identify and find all these cases of judicial review, and I should note that I now have a publicly available data set of the cases that I used in the book, both the cases upholding congressional statutes, but also cases in which the court narrowed or struck down congressional statutes given constitutional limitations. That's now publicly available on my website. 
But I think one thing we find when looking at this is, one, that the court was actively exercising the power of judicial review relative to federal laws before Marbury versus Madison was decided in 1803, that when John, Chief Justice John Marshall explained the power of judicial review, he was not embarking on something that was completely new and novel to the court. What he provided was a new explanation for the power of judicial review. But it was not the first time the court had encountered litigants who were claiming that the Constitution had been violated, nor was it the first time the court had resolved the question of whether or not congressional statutes had exceeded constitutional boundaries. Moreover, we have a traditional story in which the court had only voided statutes in two cases prior to the Civil War, one in Marbury versus Mass in 1803, but the second in Dred Scott just before the Civil War in 1857. And I think instead there are actually dozens of cases where the court was evaluating the constitutionality of federal statutes during this period, in quite a few cases where the court, in fact, was saying Congress had exceeded the bounds of its constitutional authority, and the court was going to enforce those boundaries against Congress over that period. I think it puts Red Scott in a very different context. It puts our history of constitutional law in a very different context. The court was not acting out of the blue when it was deciding a case in 1857 in Dred Scott. It was instead exercising the kind of authority it had been exercising for decades, and that litigants and parties had been encouraging it to exercise for decades, and that government officials had recognized it had been exercising for decades. Dred Scott was a far more politically salient case than was true for most of those statutes. It was a much more controversial case, and the consequences were much greater in that case than in other cases. But the nature of the power the court was exercising in Dred Scott was actually not that unusual for what the court had already been doing up to that time. Even so, even though I think there is actually more judicial review than we tend to think in the early part of the nation's history, it grew dramatically over time. The court became more active. The cases that it tended to resolve became more politically salient and tended to be more prominent. The court began to regularly strike down laws as unconstitutional. And notably, the court became more contemporaneous in how it was reviewing the constitutionality of statutes. It was not weighing in years or even decades after the law had been passed the way it tended to do actually in the first few decades of the nation's history. Instead, it was reviewing laws much more quickly, reviewing controversies that were still fresh in the public mind and fresh in politics more generally, and as a consequence, made the court a much more significant player politically than it had been earlier in its history, even though I think in general still a relatively modest player compared to the overall political system more generally. Finally, let me just note a point about the relationship of the court to American politics more generally. There's a temptation both for advocates of judicial power, but also sometimes for critics of judicial power to imagine the court really standing outside of American politics, finding some kind of locus where they can reach into American politics and enforce the constraints of the Constitution from some kind of external perspective. In practice, that's never been the way the court has operated. The court has always been attached to politics, has been part of American politics. The justices reflect the dynamics of American politics more generally all across American history. That's not suggest that the justices are simply minions of political parties or extensions of the presidencies. The justices and the court have not been toadies to political leaders elsewhere in the government, but they do tend to share the same ideals, values, perspectives that other government officials and political leaders tend to share. They reflect the same kinds of debates and concerns that are being expressed elsewhere in the government. Our political parties have partially been organized around constitutional issues. Presidents and politicians have constitutional commitments that they articulate in public. And unsurprisingly, the judges that they put on the bench share those commitments in general and try to or reflect those commitments and values in the decisions they're making on, on the court on the whole. That means that sometimes the court has been a player that has helped nationalize American politics. They've reflected national values specifically against more localist pressures in the political system. And one thing they've done is helped to build up Congress as a national political actor relative to state government officials, for example. Sometimes there's an ideological edge to what the court is doing, that it reflects the kinds of commitments that are shared by one side of the political aisle more so than the other side of the political aisle. And they're trying to advance those values and interests in particular ways across decisions. And sometimes they really are advancing things that should be understood as primarily legal. They're advancing things that lawyers care about, that judges uniquely care about, but that other politicians in the system do not in general. And that's been true all through American history, that not only does the court wind up weighing in to politically contested cases in ways that seem very familiar from thinking about American politics more broadly, but they also weigh in lots of much more technical, arcane kinds of disputes in which they're concerned about legal 
procedures and how they work. They're concerned about legal rules and whether or not they're complied with in ways that politicians are sometimes much sloppier about, don't care nearly as much about, but the judges are concerned with trying to enforce and maintain. And as a consequence, the court has been partially a force for preserving due process concerns. It's partially been a court that's concerned with protecting free speech, for example, in ways that elected politicians may have cared less about, been less committed to, less able and willing to defend, but the judges have been able to um, stand up for over time. And so while there's clearly a kind of politics surrounding the court, especially in its most salient constitutional issues, there's also something distinctly legal and distinctive about the court that reflects its unique role within the American system and the unique contributions it can make to American politics more generally. So thank you very much. A few questions about the book, and then we'll have time for, for the audience to ask questions. First, let's just talk about the study itself. You, you, as you said, reviewed over 1,300 cases. The final number you give is the court upheld 963 statutes against constitutional challenge. In the other 345, the court either struck down or narrowly construed the statute. Now, I suppose in, in some ways, by looking beyond just striking down statutes yeah. and looking to narrow constructions, that opens the door to another entire sort of body of law that's been overlooked. How did you go about actually just the work of deciding whether a statute was narrowly construed or not? I'm just curious. So I, so I think there's certainly room for disagreement on the margins as to what, how to think about particular cases, whether you are narrowly construing the statute primarily or actually avoiding it more directly. One striking thing, once you read across these cases, especially all across American history, you find that the justices are not consistent about how they tr describe what it is they're doing. There's not standard language they necessarily use in striking down laws. The syllabus provided by the court reporter is not consistent in reporting what it is the justices are doing. I mean, one weird feature of the rise of judicial review, for example, is that Congress does not get a regular report of, of laws that are being struck down. It's not that the court has to say, we've struck down a law the way the president reports that he's vetoed a law. And so as a consequence, it's often very murky as to what exactly the court is doing. And the court sometimes hides the ball, I think, in what it's doing in those cases. And so what I was concerned with in identifying cases or finding instances in which the court is substantively trying to interpret the constitutional rules as it applies to the application of a federal law in the case at hand. So are they identifying and expressing what the Constitution requires in a particular case? And are they actually applying it to the case in front of them, as opposed to simply saying, for example, there are constitutional difficulties if we interpret it this way, so we're going to avoid those difficulties. Instead, I'm concerned with, with instances in which the court says, no, here are the constitutional boundaries. We should not assume Congress has crossed those boundaries. And so we're going to have to read the statute in a way that doesn't, in such a way that a party loses as a consequence of how the court has done that. And so often that means that the government was not able to continue to apply the statute in a way they had been applying in the past because the court specifically says, if you apply it that way, it's actually going to violate the Constitution. You mentioned there's a publicly available data set. Yeah. Is there a website for this? People can just Google it. What's the so, so you can find it on my homepage at Princeton University. I've set up a page that specifically has this data set of the judicial review data set as well as sort of other things I've been, I've been doing more, more generally. So I do hope that scholars and others will find this useful. I spent an excessive amount of time <laughs> digging up these cases, and you know, I hope that they prove to be interesting to others. I mean, there are a remarkable number of cases in which I think the court straightforwardly did, in fact, render provisions of federal laws null and void in sort of a class like Marvers, Madison style, and yet they do not appear in the Congressional Research Service list. So part of the additional cases and validations are a function of the court and identifying boundaries and narrowing how to interpret laws or carving out exceptions to laws. But sometimes they're just nullifying laws, and but they've gone under the radar for what we looked at. And of course, this big bulk of cases where they've been upholding laws, I think we just don't have a handle on at all. So in the book, you, you just proceed chronologically through different eras of the court. You focus first on the early republic, and you refer to that era as, as a lost history of judicial review because scholars are missing all these cases. Focusing on the pre-Civil War era, as you mentioned in your remarks, this is largely a time of the court advancing the project of nation building, or you say facilitating the process of nation building. You point to a famous case like Gibbons versus Ogden, where the court, before it can strike down the state law 
that was limiting the interstate mm-hmm. uh, commerce, the, the ferry traffic. Before they could do that, they had to affirm the federal government's power in the first place. Can you just say a little bit more about that? that yeah, sometimes, they, I mean, it's, it's one of the interesting questions about how the constitutionality of congressional statutes and the limits of congressional power come into play in, in cases. And sometimes it's very straightforward. Somebody's challenging the application of a federal law to them and arguing that Congress has exceeded its constitutional bounds. But sometimes it comes up in these indirect ways And Givens is a classic example of it where they're primarily concerned with what the state has done. But in the process of resolving that secondary issue or that primary issue for them, they also wind up having to touch on what Congress has done. In this case, whether or not Congress has exercised an authority to license coastal traveling ships. And if so, what the scope of that license is, because what the scope of the interstate commerce power is under the congressional statute. The primary goal here for the court was to resolve the state issue. And doing so, it winds up expanding congressional power by upholding what Congress had done in, in that particular context. Yeah. In the Civil War, the main feature of the case you study is, is the timing of cases that the court, by reaching issues a little bit later, was able to reach them at a time when they were less politically salient or maybe less directly tied to the immediate interests of war and so on. But then when we get back to the post-Civil War era, the immediate aftermath of that, as you point out, the way you phrased it was striking. You said, surprisingly, the court became more activist only after it was stacked with Republican appointees. That the court was doing more and more after it was filled with the dominant political coalitions right. members. Could you just describe that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, part of what's I mean, part of what's interesting about Dahl's perspective, which I think is mostly right, how Robert Dahl tried to think about the court that it's an ally to national political coalitions. But his assumption was that if you have justices who are basically allies to the national legislative majority, the implications were that the court would never be striking down laws because they would be reviewing laws of their political allies and you know, from being passed by Congress, and they would just approve them over time. And so the court in general a lot to be a very passive institution. I think instead we find that there are all kinds of incentives for justices to be very active in striking down laws even when their political friends are in office. The justices have found reasons to invalidate and narrow laws passed by their own coalition partners in Congress, not just by their political enemies in Congress. So you would expect, Dahl would have expected a Republican-dominated Supreme Court to be upholding Republican legislation being passed by Congress and they would only strike down Democratic legislation, for example, and that's just not the way the court actually has worked in practice. You uh, described yeah. it just a moment ago in terms of incentives, not to get you mid- yeah, yeah. but what sort of incentives are there that would drive Republican-appointed judges to look with particular scrutiny at the, the laws passed by their own political coalition? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's, it's a variety of things that play out, I think, across a range of different cases. You see different elements revealing themselves. And so in some contexts, for example, you find that elected politicians will deviate from their own ideological commitments. And so a political party might well have a set of expressed constitutional commitments, but then they find because of electoral pressures or governing pressures or other things, they wind up passing statutes that actually are in conflict with those same values and beliefs that the politicians say they believe in. But the justices really do believe in. And the justices don't have to worry about getting reelected in the same way that politicians do. They aren't worried about the same governing calculations that politicians are willing to do. And as a consequence, they're more willing to stand up for the constitutional values that even the politicians say they're committed to but don't always adhere to. It's also true that politicians are sometimes simply making compromises. Even a relatively friendly Congress from the court's perspective, a Republican-dominated Congress, for example, may find itself having to make compromises with dissenting factions, with Democrats that wind up including provisions and in bills that are very far away from what Republicans would think would be acceptable generally, but it makes sense for the law rolling purposes of Congress, but the justices become much more skeptical of it. It's also true that congressmen make mistakes. There's a lot of these cases, often not the most politically salient cases, but cases that are more in the weeds, where the legal issues are just complicated. And Congress wasn't paying close attention or got things wrong, at least from the court's perspective. And part of what the court is doing is cleaning up details in those kinds of cases rather than sort of running directly against important priority policies that that Congress is trying to pursue. That's interesting. Sometimes, I mean, I think more generally, at least in this day and age, we think of the justices changing or the the justices changing once they've joined the court. Had there are certain incentives that move them in a certain direction. For years, we referred to the greenhouse effect right. for the Linda Greenhouse and the media's impact on, on Supreme Court justices, either actual or yeah. perceived. You're saying that sometimes it's the justice that stays in one position, and the part it's not that he left the party, but the party left him, so to speak. But sometimes the judges do actually 
evolve. No, sure. Certainly there's going to be cases where the judges evolve over time. I didn't specifically try to look at sort of where there's something similar to what we might imagine the greenhouse effect all through American history. You know, one thing that's striking, and I tend to focus more on the book on thinking about the court as a whole rather than individual justices, and one thing that's, that's striking when you look at this across all of American history is that the court since the early part of the 20th century has been characterized by individual opinions. So lots of justices are writing individual opinions, they're dissenting, they're concurring, there's disagreements um, on the court, especially though in this context of reviewing constitutionality of federal laws, through most of American history, those disagreements were kept hidden from public view. The justices would issue decisions without published dissents, although sometimes they would note there was a dissent. Published dissents were relatively rare, even though there, we know in some cases there were uh, dissenting views being expressed in conference privately among the justices. For example, the justices tend to maintain much more of a public face. So as a consequence, if you focus more on what individual judges are doing over that time, it, there's a lot less movement and a lot less indication of what individual judges are doing through much of American history than there is more recently, where we tend to focus much more on, well, in every case, every judge feels like they have to write their own opinion. And so you can trace in a lot of detail what they're what they're doing specifically through much of American history, that just wasn't true. Let me just a couple, ask a couple more questions about the, the classic eras of the court's history and then some big picture questions. So when you move from the post-war era to the Lochner era, an era that's generally thought of as a time in which right. the Supreme Court with conservative or libertarian justices was pushing back energetically and uniformly against progressive legislation in the states, you say that Actually, the data suggests that it was much more complicated than that. As you put it, the court interposed itself not into stark majoritarian environments where you're just reliably striking down the laws that were being passed in states. But you said these are much more complicated political environments where the political right. dynamic wasn't so cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah, the populists and progressives, I think, had a big stake in, both the ideological stake, but also a political stake in trying to portray what the court was doing was resisting the will of popular majorities. And so they wanted to pitch the idea that the people really want whatever it is, the particular legislation is, their policies that the populists and progressives want, and the courts are just rejecting that. In fact, the populists and progressives often lost elections. So they didn't actually win the elections and didn't gain the support of the American people more generally. And so partially when the court is striking things down, they're not resisting sort of obvious movements among the American people as a whole to support that legislation. Partially it's the case that even the majority party is wind up making these complex pieces of legislation that reflect a mix of different policy priorities that the court is intervening in in these instances and often intervening in ways that are in alignment with what a majority of the political coalition would tend to think, but is out of alignment with some specific minorities. It's also true, I think, that the story of, of how the Supreme Court relates to the states during this period is a little different than how the Supreme Court relates to right. Congress during this period. But it is striking given our sort of view of the Lochner period as being a period of intense activism by a conservative court against progressive legislatures. In the context of reviewing acts of Congress, what that conservative court is mostly doing is upholding acts of Congress and, and authorizing the administrative state. The national state is growing dramatically during this period. Lots of creativity as to what policies and institutions look like. And the court is overwhelmingly approving of those things. So every once in a while, they strike something down. But for the most part, they are rubber stamping what it is Congress is doing, even though what Congress is doing is radically new compared to what the federal government looked like 20, 30, 40 years before. And when we look just a few decades later in the New Deal era, yeah. the classic story is that a conservative Supreme Court was pushing back against FDR and the New Dealers until the moment in which the court saw itself as politically threatened, and so the so-called switch in time that saves nine, the court moves into a much more relaxed and deferential posture. Right. But you say, actually, even in that era, when the court was pushing back against laws, it was primarily not pushing back against the most recent New Deal enactments. You say they were pecking away at older, less politically salient laws and less central legislative provisions. And yeah. this is part of a broader theme here that you, in contrast to sort of Alexander Bickle and the idea of a counter-majoritarian difficulty, you say oftentimes the court is receiving these cases, or these no. cases challenging statutes, long after the statute was passed. So the political coalition at the time of judicial review is much different. It's no longer counter-majoritarian at, at, at all when it's striking down a statute. Yeah, no, I think that's right across the court's history as a whole. I mean, one thing that's is striking about the New Deal period, and, and really when we think of the New Deal period, we're thinking of a very small window of basically 1934 to 1937, so really three or four years during Roosevelt's first term for the most part. 
where the court is being very aggressive, it is striking down an unusually large number of laws, and those are laws that are unusually important and unusually recent. But the court activity sort of surrounding that tends not to look like that. And so one thing I was really struck by was the extent to which the New Deal is idiosyncratic, that that sort of brief conflict between Congress and the court of the FDR administration and the court does stand out as being a different moment of how the court relates itself to Congress than is true through much of its history, including how, for example, the relative of the conservative Taft Court had been behaving all through the 1920s, where they were striking down a very large number of laws, historically speaking, but it often did involve relatively minor laws. It was older laws and the like. The New Deal jumps out at you as being a moment in which for a few years there, the court was doing something very unusual. And I think it's telling that that the court could not sustain that. The political branches push back during this period. You mentioned the Civil War earlier, for example. Civil War is, is reflective of how the court often has behaved during wars, but it was particularly true during the Civil War. The court has this long window where they're not striking down anything at all. And that tends to be true a lot of wartime uh, mm -hmm. periods where the court is avoiding wartime cases. They're not striking down wartime measures. They might weigh in after the war's over and say some of that stuff was not well done and then yeah. certainly now it needs to be cleaned up. But while the war's on, the court tends to uh, take a back seat. So the Great Depression as a national crisis or comparable to war in some ways is distinctive where the court is just waiting in right in the midst of the crisis, telling Congress it can't do things, and Congress really does push back. Yeah, and... Not just in times of war, but sometimes in times of peace. Yep. The court is doing less. You, you close by pointing out that since the turn of the 21st, since the 21st century began, the court is now striking down federal statutes at a historically low yeah. pace. And I think also state laws, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, yeah. You know, that it's, well, let me just ask a couple of big picture questions then. One of the most striking lines in the entire book, as you're sort of framing all of this, is this point about the court reinforcing federal power. But the way you, you phrase it is, is very interesting. You say... An important aspect of the court's work in exercising judicial review has been in upholding laws against constitutional challenge. The court's ongoing effort to silence critics of congressional power is a crucial part of how the court advances a common project of governance with its allies in the elected branches. Now, when you say they silence critics, you don't literally mean you know, <laughs> yeah, right. saying stop arguing about this. Right. But the fact is that it's not so much that they're silencing the critics, but that when the court decides these cases, critics often fall silent and step away from the controversy. Of course, that's not always the case. We just a few weeks ago right. marked the anniversary of, of Roe versus mm -hmm. Wade, and there are certain touchstone cases that certainly didn't silence right. critics. But that's right that over that on the whole, the Supreme Court's word tends to be taken as final and authoritative, even by advocates of a, of a position. Yeah, I think, I think it's right that, the, that it does often have the effect of, of at least reducing the amount of criticism of, of given laws. But there's an interesting sort of conceptual question as to why does the court uphold so many laws it does, right? So as I noted, that three quarters of these cases involve the court upholding statutes. There's an interesting question, why bother doing those cases? And of course, through much of the 19th century, the court has mandatory, ju mandatory right. jurisdiction. Cases are coming to them. They have to resolve them. And so they don't have a choice about necessarily avoiding those cases. Through much of the 20th century, on the other hand, they have discretionary jurisdiction. Not entirely true for all of these specific kinds of cases that involve constitutionality of federal statutes, but for a lot of these, and yet even cases they're taking on a voluntary basis, they're still upholding laws and raises questions about, well, what are they doing when they're doing that? And I think part of the point of the court for taking those cases is precisely to try to instruct the lower courts in particular, but also often those who are off the, outside the judiciary about what the constitutional rules are, what the constitutional standards are from the Supreme Court's perspective, and why it is these cases are actually fine, this, these laws are actually constitutional, and so as a consequence to discourage state judges and lower court federal judges from continuing to attack those laws. One thing that was striking about the late Roberts Court, or the Roberts Court until relatively recently, is they have not taken those kind of cases. So the Roberts Court sort of changed this historic pattern and that they really have dropped cases in which they are simply going to uphold the constitutionality of the federal law um, that has also been upheld in the lower federal courts. So the, the Roberts Court instead has focused its attention when it takes these cases on cases in which it actually wants to invalidate the federal law. And that's not generally been true about the court, but it seems to be true recently. Well, since it only takes four justices out of yeah. nine to grant cert, it might also be the case that oftentimes, not only with the justices themselves, the four who grant cert, they might not know where the fifth vote is. They probably have a guess. And they might not themselves know whether they're the fifth vote, right, too. Right. It's not that the court always knows when it grants a case how it's going to decide a case, although, of course, often 
They grabbed the case precisely because they, they probably think the lower court was wrong. No, I think that's right. There's certainly some instances in which there's likely to be some uncertainty among the justices as to how the case is likely to come out. I don't think that can account for the bulk of the cases. I have a law review article that I did with a former student of mine, Ben Johnson, who's now at Penn State, who has some particular expertise in looking at um, cert grants and has done a lot of work on the construction of the court's docket, where we try to unpack some of these different effects in these particular contexts of the exercise of judicial review. So I do think courts are not knowing for sure what's going to happen with the case when they're putting it on the docket as part of what's going on, but it doesn't seem to be the whole story. Now, you quoted Justice Joseph's story and his view of judicial review. As you described it, though, it brought to my mind just maybe the most famous description of judicial review, which is Hamilton in Federal mm-hmm. 78. Lawyers and judges are all familiar with the more famous lines of exercising neither, the court exercises neither force nor will, but merely judgment. The court, when it finds a law that's unconstitutional, has to, we often say, strike down or nullify. Well, that's sometimes tendentious. Right. But they have to give effect to the higher law, the Constitution, not the lower law. Right. But elsewhere in Federal 78, Hamilton sketches out a fairly deferential view of judicial review when he's analogizing it to a contractual dispute or other things. He says, if there's a higher law and a lower law and they seem to be in conflict, the court, as long as there's a fair construction of the the statute that would allow it to withstand sort of constitutional scrutiny, then logic dictates that you must give it that construction and let them both stand. Elsewhere, he says, the court will strike down statutes that are at an irreconcilable variance with the Constitution. But that term irreconcilable variance suggests that there's such a thing as a reconcilable variance. Right. And so while Federal 78, you know, argues for judicial review, it argues for a particular kind of judicial review that's more relaxed. Right. And look, and I think, if anything, your book suggests that over the arc of history, the Supreme Court has largely followed that approach, for better or for worse. I think that's right. I think the court has generally tended to follow that approach. And one interesting question is sort of what's the significance of the court doing judicial review in that mode yeah. uh, rather than simply striking out provisions? I think sometimes sometimes this is a function of how statutes are worded, right? And so or, or how particular statutory provisions are worded, where it's easier to imagine we can just strike out this particular provision because of its conflict and leave the rest of the things in place. Whereas in other contexts, what the court effectively winds up doing is carving out exceptions to a provision where it's not very easy to imagine you could just strike this particular language and accomplish what the court thought constitutionally needed to be accomplished in those particular instances. They all have the consequence of enforcing limits on congressional power. Everybody recognizes when when the court has done that, the court has now marked out a boundary that you can't cross, and as a consequence, new statutes can't be written that cross those boundaries, new cases can't be brought that's going to apply law that's going to cross those boundaries. But it may be a way in which the court is minimizing the direct conflict with Congress, that it's a more subtle move, it's a much less public slap in the face of Congress as a consequence of that. And and as a consequence, I think that we as scholars have tended to overlook those cases and not emphasize them as much. I think they've also gotten less public attention and less congressional attention than cases where the court has simply said that's null and void and and we're going to strike it down in its entirety. I mean, here's a current example. In a few days, the Supreme Court's going to hear oral arguments in a case involving a constitutional challenge to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It has a particular structure that gives it a measure of independence from the from the president, I'll say in, in my, I'm no fan of the statute. In my right. past life as a lawyer, I was involved in some of the constitutional challenges against it. Now that the court has actually granted the case, looking at it, I wonder if, there, if they might not avoid a constitutional issue here. Ever since these debates over the agency, independent agencies started in 1935, a little bit before that, the court has said that it's okay for Congress to, to insulate some agencies from direct presidential right. removal. FDR tried to fire the FTC commissioner, and the court said it's okay for the statute to prevent the president from firing him at will. But these statutes that limit the president's removal power, they've never said expressly, explicitly the president can't fire these people over policy differences. Right. And the court has never said that these statutes forbid that kind of thing. The Supreme Court said in a recent case, they think that's the better reading, but they've never actually held it. Mm-hmm. And so if the court's going to strike down th- this aspect of Dodd-Frank, they might have to first decide, well, what does this removal protection mean? Right. Is a president blocked from firing the CFPB director over policy disagreement? And if the court construes the, these, all these statutes as saying, well, no, actually, you can fire a CFPB director or an FTC commissioner, on and on, over policy disagreements, right. 
it leaves a statute intact, yep. but it certainly recharacterizes yep. the statutes in a way that vindicates presidential power and congressional power. No, there's no question about that. And it's, it's, it's one thing I think this, these kinds of histories should emphasize is that there's a range of tools the courts have about how they address laws, and they have a range of consequences. And so I limited myself to thinking about cases in which the court was explicit in, in identifying a constitutional boundary and then trying to enforce that constitutional boundary boundary and saying that the Congress can't cross it, at least as applied in, in the case in front of them. But you can then easily imagine a lot of those exact same cases occurring, which the court just never includes language about what yeah. the constitutional limit was. They just did the statutory interpretation part. And it may be in the background, they were thinking about their constitutional problems here that we're going to try to avoid. But they don't talk about that in the case, for example. I think there probably are a lot of cases that look like that. I think they're hard to identify. It's hard to know what's motivating the justices than when they're engaged in particularly creative statutory interpretation in that light. I do think one consequence of doing it that way as opposed to the cases I am focused on in the book is that you do not then clearly articulate what the constitutional limit is, right? right? So if you keep that completely implicit and all you do is interpret the statute in a particular way, you're still leaving the door open then that sometime down the road you're going to have to deal with the constitutional issue or that Congress might continue to overreach right. from the justice perspective and continue passing new statutes that might go too far. So one virtue of this strategy of saying we're going to creatively interpret the statute so as not to run up against this hard constitutional rule is you are clearly stating what the constitutional rule is yeah. and sending signals to people about that the rule exists and that we're going to enforce it and recognize it. Well, there's still time for questions. I'd like to open it up to the audience. Please raise your hand and identify yourself. A microphone will come to you. We'll start with uh, Ed Whalen. Ed Whalen, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Thanks for the presentation. On the question of the relationship between the president and Congress, I wonder whether the bright line that you draw yeah. between federal review of federal legislation, I mean the Supreme Court and Congress, mm -hmm. between the review of federal legislation and review of state legislation overlooks the impact that the court's rulings on state legislation yeah. can have in yeah. constraining what Congress will do, especially, uh, obviously, in the last century or so in the post-incorporation period, yeah. when a ruling that states can't do X because of a rights provision in the Bill of Rights right. means that Congress can't. Do you have any observations on that? I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the messy things about this project is trying to figure out sort of where the boundaries are and what you're capturing and what you're not capturing particularly. And and so I do think it's entirely possible, for example, that, and I think you're right, especially in the context of rights provisions, that the court thinks the same provision is going to apply through the 14th and also is going to apply through provisions to Congress itself, that if they articulate it in a, in a case involving the states, it falls outside the scope of my study. Everybody may then recognize it has consequences for federal law. Sometimes that will show up in this context because the court will then later apply it to a federal law and then cite back to this other case. But you can easily imagine another context in which, for example, the lower courts are doing the same thing and that I don't necessarily track, or simply the executive branch is taking note of it and they're avoiding applying the law in ways that are going to conflict. Congress takes note of it and they stop passing statutes that are going to inflict in this kind of way. And so I do think part of what, I mean, part of what this project highlights, but I think is also just in the background of this project, is, is the extent to which there is a lot of effect the court can have on what politicians are doing that is in the dark in that sense, that they are not simply the direct instances in which the court is striking down laws, but also these other more indirect signals that the court is sending that have consequences down the road for what policymaking looks like. But you never get the explicit clash then between the court and, and others. And so when I say the court only strikes down you know, a quarter of the cases when, that's evaluating, what is much harder to get a handle on is what are the ripple effects of that? That in terms of what statutes don't get passed, how does it modify what legislative provisions wind up looking like, how does it modify what executive branch implementation of statutes look like as a consequence of those decisions. I think that's really hard to actually get a handle on. I didn't try to get a handle on it in the book, but I think it's, it's ultimately important to what the, if we're thinking about what the larger influence of the courts are. That could be your next book, Still More Repugnant Laws. <laughs> I um, think that will not be my next book. So the next question will be here, and then I saw a hand over here. You'll be next. Thank you. I'm Catherine Francois from the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. My question, you kind of touched on the New Deal moment under FDR when the executive branch was expanding quite a bit. And in response to that, the court started striking down right. many more laws. And then you also touched on how the Roberts Court has been invalidating much more laws than in the past. And I'm wondering if there's a similar moment under the Obama administration where the executive branch was expanding quite a bit, also in the wake of a financial crisis, if there's maybe a little bit of a parallel there. 
It's certainly the case that the, that the executive branch was expanding during that period. I think it's nothing like the New Deal period in terms of the relative growth of federal government generally, of the scope of federal statutes. Certainly Congress was not passing massive numbers of new laws. There's this interesting debate that I wound up trying to deal with a little bit in the book about sort of how productive Congress has been recently, for example, because Congress notably passes far fewer statutes these days than it used to. And one thing I'm try I try to touch on in the book is, is think about how active is the court relative to Congress. So we often track how many cases is the court resolving, but it sort of ignores what's happening on the congressional side. If Congress is passing a vast number of statutes, then we would expect the court to be reviewing lots more congressional statutes. I think, in fact, the court is not keeping up with how active the Congress has been in, in producing statutes. So relatively speaking, its number of cases are actually declining rather than growing relative to how active Congress has been. But that requires, in part, trying to also get a handle on, well, how productive is Congress? How many laws is it actually passed? I think for this purpose, it's important to think not in terms of how many separate bills does Congress pass, but instead to think about statutory pages that pass as one thing that's changed across time as the Congress packages its legislation differently. And so Congress is, I think, is still less productive than it used to be. It produces less stuff, but it's not as less productive as people tend to make out because Congress just passes much bigger, more complicated pieces of legislation that they once would have just broken out into lots of pieces of, of legislation. So the Obama administration is a period in which I think there is some expansion of the state. Some of those cases in Involving that wind up coming in front of the court. Not a ton, but I think the relative change is, is not nearly as dramatic as what we saw at earlier points in American history, where the state really just grew by leaps and bounds in very dramatic ways, both in terms of just genuine size, but also in terms of innovativeness about sort of how it's exercising power, which is also very, very striking. And in an era when Congress is passing fewer statutes, but the agencies are doing a lot yeah. more, some of the most interesting statements from the court on the scope of national power come in these agency cases. Yeah. In a Clean Water Act case called Rapanos, the court construes the Clean Water Act narrowly. In right. a Clean Air Act case called Utility Air Regulatory Group just a couple of years ago, the court, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, construes part of the Clean Air Act mm -hmm. narrowly to avoid constitutional problems of, right. of Congress overstepping its the bounds of federalism. Yeah, and I think it also shows how fluid these boundaries are to some degree, right? Because you can imagine cases that might be framed as cases about the constitutional authority of Congress instead getting reframed as primarily about how the administration is applying acts of Congress. Yeah. You could, and, and, and lots of opinions get written this way, you just totally ignore what the constitutional limits on Congress are per se. You don't focus on the Article One question. You instead focus on a statutory interpretation question relative to the administrative agencies yeah. and leave the Article One questions completely in the background. Again, you, you wind up then never articulating what the rule, what the constitutional rule is. You don't signal the enforcement of that constitutional rule, but it does have consequences for what policymaking and implementation policy yeah. winds up looking like. A few years ago in an article, uh, Professor Julian Mesker of Columbia said that the administrative state was now the main battlefield, and administrative law was the main battlefield for fights over federalism right. in the scope of national power. Right, right. Next question. I probably have an incentive not to say that since I focus more on constitutional law than administrative law. So yeah. constitutional law is still terribly important. Well, then the third book will be repugnant <laughs> regulations, so you can just keep going. There you go. There's lots of repugnant regulations. Yeah. Hello, uh, Bradley Jackson from the Institute for Humane Studies. I'm wondering if you can comment on some of the implications that your work has for the methodology of studying the court. Yeah. And in particular, your discussion about how oftentimes, say, Republican courts will strike down Republican laws seems to tell against the so-called attitudinal model of the Supreme Court uh, right. and also perhaps the judicial politics model and political science more broadly. How does the, the work that you've done sort of help to lead scholars of the Constitution toward a better understanding of how to study the court method? logically speaking. Yeah, I think it certainly complicates that, that narrative that you do not see. There are sort of cruder and more sophisticated versions of those kinds of, of models of, of judicial behavior. And certainly, I think the relatively crude versions that would simply emphasize partisan conflict, I don't think hold up very well, especially across the long stretch of American history. They may work better in very specific time periods, for example. I think the underlying that model, though, is a claim that, that justices have a set of constitutional commitments that they're going to enforce in a relatively predictable way across a range of cases 
over time. And I think that's probably mostly true. The justices do have a set of commitments. There's disagreement about how to characterize those commitments, or we should think about them as policy preferences, for example, or a set of constitutional understandings and judicial philosophy. But they have a set of constitutional commitments that they do, in fact, tend to implement um, over, over time. On the other hand, I think the attitudinalists, for example, within the judicial politics literature also tend to emphasize the judges are sufficiently independent, insulated, that they don't have to worry about pushback, and they will just push on those commitments. And I don't think that's quite right. I think actually all, across American industry, we see plenty of instances where the court is being cautious because of its concern about how Congress and the president is likely to respond. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks for everybody who's viewing online. The book is Repugnant Laws, Judicial Review of Acts of Congress and the Founding to the Present by Kansas Press. Please join me in thanking Professor Weddington. Thank you. Thank you.